Good morning. It's uh, great to see everyone this morning. Hope everybody's having a good start to their week. Uh, don't really have a lot this morning. Miss Lori Anderson's mom has uh, started her treatments Thursday. She said she's doing good so far. Let's be sure to keep her in her prayers. Um, the midweek Bible study is uh, Tuesday this week instead of Wednesday due to Thanksgiving. So everybody make a note of that. Remember that. So everybody show up Tuesday, not Wednesday. And uh, as you can see, the church rework, rebuild, whatever you want to call it, is started. So it's uh, just bear with it. It'll take a little while. But it's definitely some dusty things out there. Uh, any other announcements? Anything that we missed? That I missed? If not, we'll turn the service over to Cliff. Thank you, Mr. Good morning. Our first song this morning will be 738. 738. We'll sing all four verses. <clears throat> we will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Oh. 
Our God and our Father, we come before you today giving you thanks as we enter this week in which our nation puts an emphasis on the idea of thankfulness and gratitude. We come before you giving you thanks for all of the many blessings that we enjoy. We are thankful for this church that has been here for so many years as a light in this community, a place where we assemble to worship you and to remember the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ Jesus. For every individual who makes up this congregation, we are thankful. For our brothers and sisters in Christ that are meeting elsewhere throughout this county and this state, this nation and the world, we are thankful for those of like-mindedness who today are also lifting their voices in praise and prayer to you. We give you thanks for the mission efforts that we support and we ask your continued blessing to be upon them. We give you thanks for our health and our ability to be here today. We are thankful for answered prayers that we have been able to share with one another recently. We are thankful for a shortened prayer request list, evidence that you hear and answer our prayers. We are thankful for your spirit who comforts us in our time of need. And there have been those of our family, a disproportionate number of our family, who recently have experienced the loss of loved ones. And we pray for your continued blessing to be upon them, for your comfort and your peace to be upon them. We thank you for our homes. We thank you for homes that are warm. We thank you for homes that are filled with food. We thank you for homes that are filled with clothes. And we are mindful of those who do not share in those blessings. We are thankful for the forgiveness of sins that comes by the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross of Christ. We are thankful for forgiveness and realize that we fall short of your glory. And when we sin, we are thankful for that forgiveness. And we do, in fact, pray for the forgiveness of our sins. We are thankful for this nation in which we live in, where we are able to worship as we believe is right. And we pray your blessing on this nation as we for several years now and continue to face various forms of turmoil as there are great rifts in our society, as we see protests and riots, as we continue to see division about such things as vaccines and vaccine mandates. Father, I pray that you would hear our prayers, that you would as the Prince of Peace, bless our nation with peace and unity. For those who are desperate, Father, I pray that you would ease their desperation. For those who are avarice, I pray that you would help them to realize that that is not the way to happiness. I pray your blessing on our leaders. Give them the wisdom to act in the best interest of the American people, which is what they were elected to do. Father, clear our minds of whatever cares and concerns, whatever worries that we have, so that in this hour we may worship you in spirit and in truth. And that we will be blessed for having been here today is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our next song will be on the screen only. We'll sing all three verses. The light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes. Yeah. 
of thanks to the cup. Our Father, Father, we thank you for the fruit of the vine. We pray that we would take it in a way pleasing in your sight. To Christ we pray. Amen. Our next song this morning will be 929, 929, we'll sing all three verses. <coughs> Father, we love you, we worship and adore you, glorify your name in all the Yeah. 
that we are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that our unity may one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. of the law 
when you cross over so that you may enter the land which the Lord your God has given you, a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you. So it shall be when you cross the Jordan, you shall set up on Mount Ebal these stones that I am commanding you today, and you shall coat them with lime. Moreover, you shall build an altar to the Lord your God, an altar of stones. You shall not wield an iron tool on them. You shall build the altar of uncut stones, and you shall offer it on it burnt offerings to the Lord your God. And you shall sacrifice peace offerings and eat there and rejoice before the Lord your God. You shall write on the stones all the words of this law very distinctly. And so this was part of Moses' farewell address. Now here they are, after their victory at Ai, they are heading towards Shechem. Mount Ebal is on one side, Mount Gerizim is on the other. You see the image on the screen behind me. So this is where Israel is today. Now contrary to what some have tried to portray me as being, I am a staunch traditionalist. Uh, I am not a traditionalist just for the sake of tradition, uh, but I do believe that our traditions ought to have meaning, they ought to have substance. I believe that they should define us as the people of God, not to define us as a people of tradition. And so what is being established here today in our text, Joshua chapter 8, for those of you who like to follow along in your Bibles, is yes, a tradition, but it is a tradition that is filled with substance, with meaning. Joshua interrupts the military activities that Israel is engaged in in order to make a new commitment to the authority of Jehovah God as expressed in the law. As we consider the place where they were, we see that it is a beautiful place, we see that it is an historic place, and we see that it is a prepared place. And God uses this time with Israel at Shechem in between the two mountains to focus Israel's thinking. To help Israel to focus and remind them of why they are in the promised land to start with. They were not only there to defeat their enemies, but they were there to claim the land and enjoy a new home. They were there primarily to serve the Lord and honor Him and to be a witness to the lost around them about the glory of their God. But they needed to be reminded, and so do we. It's a little too easy for us to drift in our spiritual walk. It's a little too easy for us to drift in our spiritual lives. There are times when we need to refocus on the things that are most important. And so how about you this morning? Have you allowed yourself to drift in your spiritual life? Have you wandered from a place of blessing to a place of cursing in your life? A place of service to a place of self-serving. A place of surrender to a place of agenda. In Revelation 2 verses 4 and 5, we read about this very type of warning. I have this against you, says the angel. You have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Now, Revelation 2, verses 14 through 15, has something to say to you and me today, but so does our text from Joshua chapter 8. The mountains of Ebo, Ebal and Gerizim represented a place of either cursings or blessings for Israel, depending on what they did with the lessons that they learned there in the valley of Shechem, between the two mountains. And their experience reveals some areas in your life and in mine today that we need to learn to focus in on. Again, our text from Joshua chapter 8, beginning in verse 30. Then Joshua built an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, in Mount Ebal, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the sons of Israel to do, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of uncut stones on which no man had wielded an iron tool. And they offered burnt offerings on it to the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. 
He wrote there on the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he had written in the presence of the sons of Israel. All Israel, with their elders and officers and their judges, were standing on both sides of the ark before the Levitical priests, who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord, the stranger as well as the native. Half of them stood in front of Mount Gerizim, and the other half in front of Mount Ebal, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had given command at first to bless the people of Israel. Then afterward he read all the words of the law, the blessings and the curse, according to all that is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses had commanded, which Joshua did not read before the assembly of Israel, with the women and the little ones and the strangers who were living among them. And so as we look at these verses, we see several important lessons that Israel learns that's going to be important for us to learn if we want to avoid the curse and enjoy the blessings of God. The first thing that we must do is refocus on God's grace. We must refocus on God's grace. Now this has to do with salvation. This has to do with wonder. We sometimes sing the song, I stand in awe of you. This is the idea that is being communicated here. The altar that was built on Mount Ebo, uh, Ebal, the mountain of cursing, is a reminder of sin, and it is a reminder of the consequences of sin. In Proverbs 13, verse 15, we read, Good understanding produces favor, but the way of the treacherous is hard. In Romans 6, verse 25, we are reminded that the wages of sin is death. There is only one sacrifice for sin, and that is blood. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Hebrews 9, verse 22. And so the burnt offerings that they were called to offer were offerings that had to do with sin. The sinner was to bring a sacrifice to the priest. The sinner would place his hands on the head of that sacrifice, symbolically transferring the individual sin to that of the sacrifice. The animal was then slaughtered and burnt on the altar. It, it is a picture of a sinless substitute dying for the sins of the guilty party. And so the burnt offering spoke of sin, it spoke of cleansing, and it spoke of forgiveness. But it wasn't just a burnt offering that Israel was to offer here in the valley of Shechem. Yes, they were to offer the burnt offering to again refocus their minds on God's salvation. But a peace offering was also to be offered. The peace offering has to do with fellowship. The grateful worshiper would bring a sacrifice to the priest. The animal would be killed and a portion offered up to God on the altar. But the rest would be prepared and eaten by the priests and by the worshiper. It was a time, yes, of sacrifice, but it was also a time of worship as well as fellowship as well as a time of blessing. Now what is interesting here is that this altar was to be made from uncut stones. Israel was not to use any tools in the construction of the altar. Now I'm not 100% sure of the significance of that for Israel, but I do think that we can see significance for you and for me. The altar was a reminder that they were sinners, but that they could be saved from the curse of sin, but by the grace of God. It's interesting that the law says thou shalt not, and yet somehow God knew that we would. And so God established this altar. They were to make it out of uncut rocks. And I think there's at least an image, at least a picture for you and me. And that is, there's nothing you and I can do to merit our salvation. It was not, <coughs> excuse me, it was not by the works of men. It was by the work of God. And one of the images that we can see here is the fact that the altar was made out of these uncut stones. Okay, Israel might have stacked the stones, but they did not do the work of fashioning the stones. God's the one who did that work. And so that is why He sent the perfect substitute. 
for you and me. Because He knows we can't be good enough, righteous enough, holy enough. God sent Jesus to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. God made Him who knew no sin to become sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. He sent His Son to die. We oftentimes say cross, but let us also understand, yes, it was an altar. It was an altar where the blemishless Lamb of God died for our sins. And so Jesus died on the altar of the cross so that you and I might be saved by grace apart from our own efforts, apart from our own works, or by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. The grace of God is still the only hope that we have. By the way, the altar was built before the law was read. The altar was built before the law was read. And I think that there is some significance here as well. There, there are those who have a misunderstanding about the Old and New Testament. Some of us have this idea that God gave His Old Covenant or His Old Testament and somehow we humans messed everything up. And so now God is in crisis mode trying to figure out what I'm going to do now. Now that these humans have messed up my plan, what am I going to do now? Uh, I have a couple problems with that notion. Actually, I have more than a couple. Uh, I have several problems with that notion. First of all, I think it's the height of hubris to think that we human beings can mess up any plan of God. Uh, that's my first problem. Uh, my second problem is that God doesn't deal in accidents. Our God is not a God who deals in accidents. Uh, he understood. He knew. As we've already said, God said, thou shalt not, but somehow He knew we would. And so God's plan, eternal plan, wasn't one of, here's the old covenant, man messed it up, now I've got to figure out what plan B is. God's eternal plan was from the beginning. The old law serves, as Paul has said, as a tutor, as a guide pointing us to the new. Humanity needed to realize that no, he couldn't do it on his own. She couldn't do it on her own. And so the law taught us that lesson. But by no means ever make the mistake of thinking that God didn't think this whole humanity thing out before he made man. No, he had already thought the whole thing through. And I think we see a picture of this here. The altar was built because God knew they're going to need an altar. And then the law was read. So the first thing we need to do today if we want to experience God's blessings as opposed to God's cursings in our lives is to refocus, and we need to refocus on God's grace. The second thing that we need to do is refocus on God's guidelines. And this has to do with our service. This has to do with our walk with God. Now, we're not going to read it, but I will reference you the entire two chapters of Deuteronomy 27 and 28. There, the law is being read, and you're going to see a series of amens. The law is being read, and the people respond with their various amens. This was voiced as their commitment to honor the law, uh, and their understanding that keeping it was a blessing. They were affirming what was being read there in Deuteronomy 27 and 28. When the law was read, the people voiced their assent to it. They were making a commit to honor, obey, and pass on the law of God. They were making a commitment to the law of God and that it would be the standard by which they would live their lives. They were making a commitment to the law of God and to following that law and to teaching that law to future generations. They were making a commitment understanding that their obedience to that law would result in God's blessings and their disobedience to that law would make them a cursed people. We are not saved, you and I, by keeping the law. Thankfully, because no one can keep the law perfectly and that is the standard. 
James tells us that whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point of it has become guilty of all. A number of years ago, I got pulled over for speeding. There was a reason why I got pulled over for speeding, and the reason was I was speeding. And so the officer comes to the window, and do you know why I pulled you over? And I said, I've got a pretty good idea, but I'd just as soon not incriminate myself. And he said, I caught you doing whatever in a whatever. I don't even remember what it was. And I said, yes, sir. Uh, and he said, uh, do, you have any, do you have any charges, anything on your record? And I said, no, sir. I'm a law-abiding citizen. And then it hit me. And so I had to qualify it. No, sir, I'm a law-abiding citizen, uh, except for speeding. <laughs> well, the law serves as a standard for living. But again, I might like to say that I am a law-abiding citizen. But as soon as I go 48 down Stewart's Ferry Pike, which is a 45 speed limit, I've become a lawbreaker. It's not kind of lawbreaker. It's lawbreaker. Now, thankfully, speeding isn't a felony, but still, you see the point. Those who honor the law will be blessed. Those who do not will be cursed. We know that as Christians, we are not under the law. The law is not something that we have to pursue in order to be in favor with God. The law is not something that we must keep in order to affirm our salvation. But we cannot escape the truth that the law is something that God has written in our hearts. Romans 2 verse 15. In that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately accusing or defending them. And, and so God has written the law on our hearts. It doesn't matter how degenerate a person you may run into in our society. And even in our society, there are still some things that are, for the most part, universally true. For example, most people that you will come across will admit that murder is at least not a friendly thing. Most people will say bad or immoral or illegal. Most people will be stronger. But as a general rule, you're not going to walk up to someone who will say, you know what, uh, I'm in favor of murder. Because this is inherently wrong. And we know this. And it doesn't matter what your religious or political or whatever else viewpoints are, most people are opposed to it. Why? Because, yes, there are universal truths. God has written His law on our hearts. We do not keep the law in order to earn anything from God, but we do obey His commands because we love Him and want to please Him. I delight to do Your will, O Lord my God. Your law is written within my heart, the psalmist said in Psalm 40, verse 8. The law of God is not a means of salvation. Obeying God is not the way in which our sins are forgiven. It is a way of saying, I love you, Lord. John 14, verse 15. And honoring the law of God puts us in a special place, a special place of blessing. And it brings His blessings into our lives. John 14, 21. Who, he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and will disclose myself to Him. We need to refocus our lives on the truth that by living by God's standard brings us into a place of special blessing, while refusing God's standard for living brings us into a place of cursings. And then finally this morning, we need to refocus on God's glory. This has to do with surrender. This has to do with worship. And so, Joshua 20, beginning in verse 30 again. Then Joshua built an altar to the Lord, the God of Israel, in Mount Ebal, just as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded the sons of Israel, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of uncut stones on which no man had wielded a, an iron tool, and they offered burnt offerings 
on it to the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. So, Israel is still surrounded by their enemy. They've made inroads. They have conquered uh, Jericho. They have conquered Ai. And now, here they are, pushing deeper into enemy territory. And they decide, surrounded by their enemies, to take a break. To put their fears aside and submit to the will of God and worship. And we need to come to a place in our lives where we ourselves are not distracted by the enemy. We are not deterred by the presence of the enemy. Is the enemy here? Yes. The enemy is here. The enemy is present. But the Word of God has said that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. The enemies of Israel would not prevail against them as they were conquering the promised land. Verse 33 tells us that the ark was in the valley. The ark of the covenant was in the valley. So, on this side, we have got Mount Ebal. On this side, we have got Gerizim. In the middle, right here, we have got the Valley of Shechem and the Ark of God, the Ark of the Covenant, is situated between the Mount of Cursing and the Mount of Blessings. Now remember, the Ark of the Covenant represented the manifest presence of God in the nation, in the life of the nation of Israel. And so on one side of the Ark was the Mountain of Blessing. On the other side of the Ark was the Mountain of Curse or Cursing. And the picture is clear. To be on the right side of the Lord is to be in the place of blessing. While to be on the wrong side of the Lord is to be in the place of cursings. And there are no gray areas for you or me today. There is only black and white. There is only right and wrong. If we walk in the right, if we walk in the Word of God, then we will be blessed. If we choose not to, then we will suffer God's punishment. We need to reach a place in our lives where nothing is more important than living our lives as a statement of active, visible worship to God and His glory. Romans 12, verse 1, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. At the end of the day, His glory is all that matters. Whether you eat or drink, or whatever it is you do, do all to the glory of God. And so this morning, the question that comes to you and the question that comes to me is, where do you stand? Are you on Ebal, the Mount of Cursing, or are you on Gerizim, the Mount of Blessing? Which side of the things of God are you on? Either we stand on the Mountain of Cursing or we stand on the Mountain of Blessing. Either we are on the right side of God or we are on the wrong side of God. Either we are doing the things that pleases Him or we are not doing the things that pleases Him. And so where do you stand today? This morning... Have you been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ? Have your sins been placed on the altar and taken away by a sinless substitute? Is your faith in Jesus Christ and Him alone for your soul's salvation? Are you honoring God's law by the way in which you live your life today? Are your priorities in order? If God says something is wrong, do you accept that as being the case and avoid it? If God says it's right, do you embrace it? Can you say amen as Israel did to the blessings of God? Or have you allowed some things to drift in your life? There is still a place of surrender. There is still a place of sacrifice. There is still a place of service for all of those who want to experience the blessings of God in their lives. So, where are you? Paul asked this question. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous and <coughs> strong. And so this morning, if you have not laid your sins on the altar of the cross of Christ and allowed His blood to forgive those, then we would be happy to 
hear your confession, and have your sins washed away in the waters of baptism. And if as a Christian you've come to realize that your life has begun to drift some, we would be happy to pray with you and pray for you. Whatever your need, if you're subject to the Lord's invitation, Jesus invites you, and we stand and sing to encourage you. Wonderful story of love, tell it to me again. Wonderful story of love, wake the immortal strain. Angels with rapture announce it, shepherds with wonder receive it. Sinner, oh, won't you believe it? Wonderful story of love.